All right. Well, uh, here's a little perspective before we get started. This is like my preamble, if you will, for tonight's lesson. In this lesson, we're going to be learning that John taught the Jews to repent. Now, repentance is a change of mind, a change of attitude towards God, oneself, and one's own sin. Repentance is the sinner's acknowledging, in effect, God, you are right and I am wrong. Everything you commanded, God, is good and righteous and holy, and I have no hope in my own ability to save myself from the power of my sin or the judgment it deserves. Because I'm a helpless sinner, I cannot change my way of thinking or living. You alone can save me and change my life. You know, repentance is like the work of God. Excuse me, repentance like this is the work of God by His Holy Spirit, and it leads to the new birth. It is a new birth which leads to desire leads to desire to leave all sin and live a life that will please the Lord. God doesn't ask a sinner to promise to leave his sin and never do it again before he will save him. God knows it's useless to ask sinful man to change himself and to stop sinning. In Jeremiah 13:23 the question is asked if a leopard uh, if a leopard can change its spots. And the answer is in the same verse. Those who are accustomed to doing evil cannot do good. God does not ask for the vain promises of a helpless sinner. Nor does he strike a bargain with the sinner, telling him that if he does certain things or promises to do them and ceases to do other things, then God will forgive and cleanse. God does not require reformation as a prerequisite to salvation. Eternal life is a gift given by God's grace alone. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. Tonight we talk about repentance. But before we do, let's take, a, let's take a quick look and see, uh, before we look at where we're going, let's take a look at where we've been last week. What approximately 4,000-year-old promise did God fulfill when Jesus was born? He sent the deliverer, right? 4,000-year-old promise. What does Emmanuel mean and why does it apply to Jesus? God with us. And Jesus is, what, is God with us. That's right. Jesus, who is God, came to earth to be born and to live as a man. So where did the prophet Micah predict the deliverer would be born? Bethlehem, right? <laughs> and <laughs> Surround sound is now on. <laughs> there, there, there will be a small delay from the back row. Uh, <laughs> it, <laughs> And Bethlehem is in what region? Judea. There we go. All right. And out of the out of the two different kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, which kingdom does Judea belong to? The northern or the southern, right? And the two southern tribes that comprise the southern kingdom are Judah and Benjamin. All right. Very good. All right. Just thought I'd reach back in a couple lessons ago. All right. So when Jesus was 12... He was mistakenly left behind in Jerusalem. What did his parents re, or what did his parents return to find him doing? Uh, it's all right. I almost sounded like we were talking in tongues. Uh, There's so many different voices coming at one time. Where was he or what did he do? What was he found doing? Yes, ma'am. He was asking and answering questions of the religious leaders in the temple, right? So when Mary asked Jesus why he, uh, why he had stayed behind, what was he expressing when he said that he needed to be about his father's business? Yeah, he, yeah he, he, his awareness, he was, uh, he was expressing that awareness that he was God's son and that he was on a mission from God, right? And that's what we see there. And so that's just a quick summary of where we were. So where are we going tonight? Well, tonight what we're going to look at is how God set the stage to reveal the deliverer. And we've been studying this last couple of weeks. And we see that human planning, now think about it, this human planning uh, would have leaned towards world banners and trumpets to announce who he was. Could you imagine if, uh, if the foretold uh, deliverer was coming in the 21st century, what we had done? We'd have to give out you know, we'd have to go have some banners printed. Uh, we'd, have, we'd definitely have to have some flyers. We'd have to get something on Facebook. 
uh, probably a short introduction video to YouTube. Uh, you know, we would call the local newspaper, maybe even do a news article on it that this coming Messiah, this deliver that promised back in Genesis chapter three was finally going to be here. Uh, we would we would roll out the red carpet, wouldn't we? Is that what we see that God does? <laughs> it says God's plan was to use a wild looking man with poor, rough clothing and strange eating habits to prepare the way for him, the deliverer. God's ways are definitely not our ways, are they? They're much higher than our ways and our thoughts. You know, this unusual herald, that's John, would preach a heart-piercing message to help people realize their need for the deliverer to save them from their sins. And so, let's jump right in. What I want us to see here is that John believed God. That's right, John believed God. He knew that he was a sinner, that being John was a sinner, but he trusted God to save him from everlasting punishment. Not only that, John believed in the deliverer who he knew would, be, would soon be revealed. And when John had grown into manhood, it was time for him to begin his ministry. So what had John been chosen by God to do? To prepare the way, right? To prepare the Jews to receive the deliverer. And so uh, that's what he'd been chosen to do. Well, turn to, hopefully you have your Bibles open now. Turn to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, and we'll be in verses 1 and 2 starting off. And in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let's stop there for just a second. Now look up on the chronological, or the, it's not a chronological map, but look up on the map here in Judea. And so these are some of the cities that you should be familiar with in the Judea region. Uh, and so we have Emmaus. Remember the two disciples we read about later on on a road to Emmaus. They're leaving the holy city and they're, they're heading to Emmaus. Uh, there's Jericho. Remember Jericho from the Canaanite, the Canaanite conquest. Uh, and then you see Jerusalem itself, the holy city, and Bethany, and then Bethlehem, which is six or seven miles uh, south of Jerusalem. And so just to get you familiar with the area that we're talking about tonight. So. How far was that? Bethlehem. Six to, seven, six to seven miles. Uh, and that was a full day's travel. Oh, yeah. There is, it's a hilly region there. So every, remember, every direction leads up to Jerusalem. And so if, if you were leaving, if you were leaving uh, uh, Bethlehem uh, to head upward, uh, to head to Jerusalem, you're actually heading uphill, and it's fairly treacherous, they say. So I've never personally been over there. I flew over it a thousand times in Google, though. <laughs> And so John, we would read, would urge the Jews to repent so that they would be ready to receive the deliverer. Now, to, re to repent means this. It means that they would have a complete change of mind and heart about God and about themselves and about their sin. Now, think about this, okay? Their attitude about God needed to change. They needed to understand uh, He is the only true God and that they should serve and worship only Him. So instead of giving him mere lip service and only professing to worship him, they were to agree that he deserved first place in their lives. Not only that, their attitude about themselves needed to change. They needed to realize that they had sinned against God by disobeying his laws and that they were unable to make themselves acceptable to him. Remember what we've been learning in the last 31 lessons, that in order for you to approach God, you had to do it, you've always had to do it his way. Not a way that you thought was fit and becoming of him. You had to do it exactly the way that he instructed you to do it. Look at the case of Cain and Abel. Uh, one, did, uh, one did exactly God's way and the other one didn't. And it was not an acceptable sacrifice. We look at this pattern all the way through the Old Testament. And so they need to understand that they were unable to make themselves acceptable to God. But also their attitude about sin needed to change as well. They needed to acknowledge that their sin was against God and that since he hates sin, they deserved his judgment. That's right. Even Jews, everyone deserves his judgment. And so this is what this is what John urged the Jews to do when it came to repentance. And so you see up here to summarize it, to repent is to agree with God, to agree with God about himself, about ourselves and about our sin. And so. Every one of us should agree with God concerning these very same truths. Nothing's changed 
over the eons, over the time. Uh, every one of us, every man, woman, and child, everyone should agree with God concerning these same truths. We need to realize that God is the true God and we should worship Him alone. Not only this, but we need to realize that we have sinned against God by failing to honor and to obey Him. We are sinners. And as sinners, we are un unable to make ourselves acceptable to God. We also need to realize that because God is a holy God, He hates sin. He cannot overlook our sins. He will never accept even our most sincere efforts to do the right thing. We deserve God's punishment. That's what we need to agree upon. That's by definition what true repentance is. Well, John was the one who the prophet Isaiah had said would precede the promised deliverer. And so, if you have your Bibles open, uh, I keep saying that, I'll stop saying that. Uh, Turn to Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah 43. Isaiah 40, verse 3. This is what the, the Lord gave to the prophet Isaiah about this coming messenger. He says, The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now remember how many years... Did I, the prophet Isaiah precede the time of John the Baptist and Jesus? Around 700 years, right? And so 700 years earlier, the Lord gives the prophet, one of his prophets this word uh, where he says this. He says, the and he's talking about the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Well, it's interesting when you, when you, when you contrast that with how John's described. John was a poor man. Look at Matthew 3, 4. We'll be in Matthew a lot, so we won't be switching around quite as much. In Matthew 3, 4, it says, Now John himself was clothed in camel hair. There's some fine apparel for you. How many of you ever rode a camel before? Oh, hey, look, okay. So that's three people in the room in Missouri. Who would have figured? Uh, <laughs> Southside Festival here. Southside Festival? Okay. <laughs> now, how many, how many have smelt a camel's true essence <laughs> nasty <laughs> nasty smelling creatures could you imagine being uh, have an outfit could you imagine having a onesie made out of camel hair <laughs> well there's an image for you right <laughs> sorry about that <laughs> and so it says that uh, John in 3 4 in 3 4 it says that that now John himself was clothed in camel hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Okay, that's interesting. Notice that although, although John believed God and was appointed as his messenger, God did not make him a rich man. John actually ate food that was found in the wilderness and wore the clothing of a poor man. So think about, contrast that with some of the prophets today, some of the self-proclaiming prophets today uh, that God wants... You know, God shows his favor on them by giving them a bunch of material possessions. They get to wear the finest apparel, the finest clothes, have gold rings all over them, you know, nice, beautiful cars, bowling alleys in the basements of their house. And that is a sign that they're God's anointed prophet. That's much different than what we read about John the Baptist, the one that was come that God sent ahead of Christ to prepare the way and, and for people to prepare, prepare their hearts to receive this deliverer. He was a poor man and he was dressed as a poor man and he ate food of someone that would live in the wilderness living on the land. So, God does not promise riches to those who repent and believe also. Like John, many of those who had followed God had been very poor. And later we notice that even Jesus, God's own son, was a poor man when he lived here on the earth. And so it's much different than, uh, than the picture that some people today would paint. And so look in five, verses 5 through 6 here. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him. That's John that we just read about. And were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. And so what we see is that many of the Jews repented when they heard what John told them. Now remember in, in the, the opening dialogue, the preamble I caught it and stuff, where John would be known for preaching a heart-piercing message. And these people came to him to hear this message. 
Their thinking was completely changed, Scripture tells us, concerning God themselves and their sin. They agreed with God that they were sinners and they believed that he was going to send the deliverer. And John told those who repented that they were to be baptized. Now through baptism, they would be demonstrating that they had accepted John's message of repentance. They would be showing that they agreed with God about deserving death for their sins and that they were trusting in God to send the deliverer to save them. Now, I want to be very careful here and very deliberate in the next couple of moments as we talk through the reason for this, this baptism of repentance and, and how it ties with soteriology or, or, or so, the doctrine of salvation, okay? Uh, it's not changed. Uh, we've never been saved by works. We've always been saved by grace and faith. God's grace and our faith in what God's going to do. And so, and so we're going to walk that out here. Baptism did not make these Jews acceptable before God. They could not go into the baptismal waters and cleanse themselves to make themselves approachable or acceptable to God. That's the first thing I want us to see. But what was it? Well, it was an outward act which, did, which illustrated their inward repentance and belief in John's message. Okay? And without this inner repentance and faith, their baptism would have been a meaningless ceremony. Baptism does not make anyone acceptable for God. God doesn't accept baptism as the way for sinners to be cleansed of their sin. So let me ask you a question. Why can't baptism wash away sin or pay God for sin? It's not a it, it, say that again. It's not, a it's, not a, it's not an acceptable sacrifice, right? What, what's the wages for sin? Death. And without and how is death paid for or, or sin paid how has it been paid for up to this point? Blood. Through the blood of what? Bulls and goats, right? But scripture also tells us that uh, that the blood of bulls and goats is unable to pay and completely satisfy the wrath of God for man's sin. And so we're gonna see how this plays out here. Their baptism without an inward repentance. And belief in John's message, their baptism would have been a meaningless ceremony. And so baptism does not make anyone acceptable. Uh, it is because baptism can't wash away sin and pay for sin because the payment for sin is death. But baptism is a public way of showing others that a person agrees with God's message and that he is trusting only in God's deliverance from the punishment he deserves for his sin. And so you see, it's still agreeing with what God thinks towards sin. And so, let's carry this a little further. So let's, let's do a comparison and contrast. So, religious leaders came to where John was baptized. And do you know that? The religious leaders of the time came to where John was baptized. And they were proud people, Scripture tells us, who refused to admit that they were sinners. Therefore, John was absolutely forthright when he spoke to them. Now, John watered his message down when they showed up on site, right? Uh, that's what we read in Scripture. You got, oops, Oh, how are you doing? How are you doing? Uh, oh, exalted one. No, John, John did not. John didn't mince his words when he came to them, did he? Nor did Jesus later on. And so look here in verse 7, chapter 3, verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said this, brood of vipers. <laughs> it's not the nice greeting of the day, right? Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And so that's how John addressed them. And so what we see here is that the the Pharisees were one of the groups that John addresses. The Pharisees thought they could please God. This is important. The Pharisees thought they could please God and be acceptable to him by strictly adhering to religious rules. Did you catch that? They thought they could please God and be acceptable to him by strictly adhering to religious rules. And over the years, they added their own interpretation and rules to God's commandments. Now, remember what I said. It's always been we were to approach God on God's terms. They're wanting to dis decide what the terms are. These religious laws regulated every area of their lives, including the way they dressed and what food they ate. And in their efforts to keep themselves pure, the Pharisees separated themselves from anyone who did not live by the same strict regulations. They tried to make their lifestyle as close as possible to what they thought would be pleasing to God. What they thought would be pleasing to God. And so, the other group that's mentioned here is the Sadducees. 
Uh, they were another proud group whom John, John addressed. Now, this sect was usually made up of the temple priests and the richer classes of Jewish society. And although they attended the temple services and claimed to worship God, they did not believe many things which God had written his word. They only accepted the writings of Moses. They didn't even believe in angels, demons, life after death, the resurrection, or the judgment of sinners. They didn't believe in a whole lot. The Sadducees were politically motivated. They wanted to please the Roman rulers and thus ensure they kept their own position as Jew Jewish leaders. And so other Jewish leaders mentioned in the New Testament were also there, and they were called scribes. Now, scribes were men who copied the original writings of the prophets onto new scrolls. They, they are also known as lawyers or teachers of the law because their job included interpreting the meaning of God's laws and the writings of the Jewish prophets. Many scribes were proud of their scriptural knowledge, and they thought they were pleasing to God because they had mentioned large sections of the Old or excuse me, memorized large sections of the Old Testament, and they regarded themselves as better than other people because they taught and thought that they knew the meaning of God's word. Unfortunately, their interpretations were often incorrect. So, why do you think this was so? Why do you think they thought that about themselves? That's right, because of pride. Because they also, uh, because the scribes also followed their own ideas. Say that again. <laughs> That's right. And think about this, it has a little note here. They sat under the teaching of men, and they were very proud of the fact of who their instructors were. They did a lot of name dropping, I can imagine. Oh yeah, well, my my rabbi uh, was Rabbi so and so, but here's the problem, and this is what they write here: they had not been taught by God. So you can name drop all you want, but it doesn't matter unless you've been taught by the the one true living God. We're to worship God in spirit. And in truth, and because God can't lie, every word that that he's breathed out that we call Holy Scripture is true. That's where true teaching comes from. And in the church age, teaching comes from the, God, the Holy Spirit. As he dwells inside every believer and he illuminates God's word. He brings out the truth of that word uh, and he convicts us of it. He convinces us of us. He prays for us. He prays against us, I'm sure, many times. And it was capable for grieving the same spirit. We have to be instructed by God. So let's move on. John spoke very bluntly to the scribes. Now, could you imagine if I would have started tonight and said, welcome, you brood of vipers? <laughs> well, that would have been a conversation starter. Uh, you know, giving each other a hard time about, you know, serving the Naval Scouts or something like that is one thing, but calling each other a brood of vipers is something much more serious. And so John spoke very bluntly to these scribes and Pharisees uh, and, and, and Sadducees because they were so arrogant. Look at seven again. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And so God is against the proud, right? We talked about their pridefulness. God is against the proud, uh, but he helps the humble. You know, stubborn pride was a problem with the Egyptian Pharaoh in the time of Moses. Remember during the time of Exodus we talked about when God sent Moses uh, to Pharaoh uh, to let his people go? We see that pride was the problem for that Pharaoh. Uh, it was because of Pharaoh's pride that God dealt so harshly with them. And through Moses, the Lord asked Pharaoh, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? And in James 4, 6 says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And this means that God resolutely opposes those too proud to agree with what he says about them and his word. But he helps and delivers those who admit they are sinners needing to be saved. Do you remember the illustration? Oh, wow. It was uh, 20 lessons ago. <laughs> I know it's hard to believe. Remember I put the, the picture up there of a guy? Uh, going down the river in a, in a torrent of water uh, and everyone told that one guy that was a strong swimmer why don't you jump in to save him and so he let him struggle till finally the guy acknowledged that he couldn't save himself and he cried out for help and then this strong swimmer jumps in 
And he says, and, and the people, once they got him to the bank, they say, why did you wait until then? He goes, well, until he was willing to acknowledge that he needed my help and needed to be saved, I couldn't save him. But the minute he acknowledged that, I was able to get in. I was able to pull him safely to the bank. That's what God does to each and every one of us. We have to get to the point where we acknowledge we can't save ourselves. And it's only God that can save us. And it's in that moment that we truly humble ourselves and we put our pride aside and we ask God to save us. And God is faithful to save us. That's what we see throughout Scripture. Well, John taught that good works are the evidence of faith. Hold on, now we're talking about works. <laughs> yes, works are very important in the right order. Now we agree that there's no way that we can clean ourselves up. Even on our best day, our greatest work, our greatest accomplishment our greatest uh, glorious moment is like a filthy rag in the eyes of a holy, righteous, and just God. But works do play a part. And so what John taught was that good works are the evidence of faith. Look in verse 8 right here. Therefore, this is what he tells them. Uh, he, and right now it's still in the context of talking to these Pharisees, scribes, and Sadducees. It says, therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. <laughs> Ouch. John told the Pharisees and Sadducees that if they repented and believed God, it would be evidenced by a change in how they lived. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were proud. Let me make sure I didn't, that felt like I did something. Yes, I was right. Okay. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were proud that they were descendants of Abraham. And so this is part of this pride problem they have. Let's look at this. Look at verse 9. And do not think to say to yourselves... We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. You know, many of the Jews were proud that Abraham was their nation's father. They thought that God would accept them because they were Abraham's descendants. But we know that God will never accept anyone because of the faith of their faith and others. It must be a faith in God. And so some people today uh, think that they are automatically accepted by God because of other people's faith or holiness. My dad's a preacher. <laughs> well, my dad's the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Well, my dad was on the translation for, you know, uh, the Christian Standard Bible. Or the, uh, we, we even do this today. We think that way. Or a lot of times, well, I hang around all the people I hang around with are church people. Isn't it evident to you that I'm a Christian? So let me ask you a question. Why is it incorrect thinking? Why is that so incorrect? No one can save you by Christ. And, and, and let's, let's walk that back a little bit further. Because God judges collectively or people individually? Individually, right? And so belonging to a group will not save you. Hang with the wrong crowd or the right crowd will not save you. Each of us must stand before God as individuals and give an accounting. Now don't trip that up with the, the, the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne. We're not, we're not talking about that, but every one of us has gives accounting to God alone. Okay. So we are born in this world as individuals and we will die and be judged by God as individuals. Each person is responsible for his own relationship with God. No one, hear me, no one will ever enter heaven on the reputation of someone they think may have influence with God. No one. Neither our family ties nor our religious affiliation can make us acceptable to God. So instead of these things, by what does God judge us? So, now, so we agree that being around the right people, knowing the right people will not save us, right? And so, by, by what account or by what does God judge us on then? Right, our faith uh, or uh, perhaps a better answer that they provide is our heart attitude towards him. Do we truly trust him? Are we really putting our faith in what God has done for us? Do we really believe that when Jesus hung on the cross and he shed his blood for us, that that, that, that that sacrifice was found acceptable to God the Father, that it covered every one of our sins, past, present, and future. Do we really believe that? Do we really believe that Jesus Christ 
was God in the flesh and that he is the promised deliverer that we heard about from 4,000 years, 6,000 years ago from today. Do we really believe that? And we, do we really believe that he's going to come back and judge the world in righteousness? That's the type of trust that God He says, this is what my word says. You put your trust in that word and I'll save you and you live by faith. And so that's what we see here. God cares about our heart attitude towards him. Now, I want to make a distinction here. Notice what it doesn't say. God does care about our outward actions, about the works that we produce, the fruit that we produce. But it's the heart. He gets to the heart of the matter. What is our heart attitude towards him? If our heart is right with him and been made right, then we'll produce righteous works. So, this, could you imagine how difficult of a message this was for people in Judaism in the first century? That we're, we're keeping over 613, 613, 614 laws. Every law. And they, and they were trying their best to keep it. And, and so imagine how difficult this, this could have been for them. And so what we see here is that John told the Pharisees and the Sadducees not to trust in their kinship to Abraham. What? You're talking about, I'm, I'm from, I'm from, you know, that's Father Abraham. He's the father of our nation. God said he's going to bless them. Uh, he's going to be the father of many nations and that his descendants are going to be as numerous as the grains of sand on the beach and the stars in the sky. What are you talking about? Uh, don't trust in, their, in our relationship with Abraham. Well, to emphasize the futility of such a trust, John added that if God wanted to, he could turn the stones on the ground into children of Abraham. <laughs> Think about that. John wanted these religious leaders to understand that as far as God was concerned, they had nothing to boast about. And so in what way were these religious men just like everyone else? They were sinners. Well, God's judgment will fall on some of the sinners, a few of the sinners, or all of the sinners. All. Look in verse 10. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Notice that God says the cutting will take place at the root of the tree. Not a limb at the root of the tree. The whole tree is no good and therefore is to be cut down. You know, it is not that we just do some things that are wrong. It's that we are wrong. <laughs> Think about that. It's not that we just, we, we do a couple. It's not, let me break that down a different way. It's not that we just sin some. It's that we're sinners. We are sinners and God's judgment is on us, not merely on the things that we do. Now, we have to be very careful here, and this is a true statement. God hates the sin and not, finish that, and not the sinners, right? However, who gets cast into the lake of fire that doesn't put their trust in God? Is it the sinner or the sin? It's the sinner. So we need to be careful there, okay? And God absolutely came uh, to offer his son as a ransom for everyone that would put their trust in him. Absolutely. But in the end times, if you jump ahead to the last book, you'll see that all those that do not put their trust in him, all those sinners that do not put their trust in him are cast in the lake of fire. It's very sombering, isn't it? Well, we are sinners and God's judgment is on us, not merely on the things that we do. And so John knew that the coming deliverer was superior to him. That's right. We all know this, right? John knew that the coming deliverer was superior to him. And look in verse 11. I indeed baptize you with, with water and to repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so, though John had been given the important responsibility of preparing Israel to receive the deliverer, he did not want in any way to draw attention to himself. He reminded the crowd who had gathered to hear, hear him that he was a mere man, and he emphasized that the coming deliverer was far greater than he was. Well, John saw himself as an unworthy to be even, or John saw himself as unworthy to be even, even the lowliest of servants to the coming deliverer. And so at the time John lived, many people kept slaves. <gasps> slaves? Yes. And one of the, the slaves' responsibilities was to take off their master's shoes 
when they returned from walking on the dusty streets. Now with this in mind, John said that he was not even worthy to be the servant who would take off the deliverer's shoes. So what did John recognize about this coming deliverer? Was he just a man? Well, John recognized that he would not be just a man, but the Son of God, the Creator of the world. Not a thing was made that was not made through this coming Deliverer, this Logos. Well, John knew that the Deliverer had given him life and that he was greater than John. John said that the Deliverer would do something far greater than baptize people. John baptized those who repented, but the coming Deliverer would do something far greater. He would give the Holy Spirit to those who trusted in Him. Do you, do you, do you understand just how awesome and how, how grateful we should be for the gift of the Holy Spirit that lives in each and every one? That is a miracle. When, when, to be born again from above, to receive God the Holy Spirit indwelling us, sealing us for all eternity for salvation. That empowers us. It's not a spirit of fear. Paul would write Timothy, but it's one of power, one of love, and one of self-control. In the Old Testament times, the Holy Spirit was present at certain times and, and was with certain people, led them, filled them at certain times. But they had not received the gift of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit for all those that had put their trust in God. That happened at, at Pentecost. And so in the church age, we have God's Spirit living in us. So when we say, I just can't do it, that's a start. You can't, but the one that lives in you can that's the Holy Spirit that Jesus is going to baptize with. It's much greater than any water repentance. And so let's look right here. John said that the deliverer would do something far greater than baptize people, uh, that he would give the Holy Spirit to those who trusted in them. And we see that John said that the deliverer would separate unbelievers from believers. Do you know when someone says that I'm a Christian, but I've not been born again, I do not have the Spirit of God living in me? They are not a Christian. Uh, they might self-identify, but if you do not have the Spirit of God in you, uh, a sign that you have been truly saved, that you have been born again from above, you're not a Christian. You can say it all you want. That's the same as standing in and saying, I'm, I'm a Mustang. <laughs> no, no, you're not. You might want to be, but you're not. Uh, you can sit there and wish all your time. It, it comes to repentance and faith. And at that moment, you, you truly believe and that you've justified before God. Uh, God fills you with this Holy Spirit and he begins a work of sanctification in you. That's evidence that you've been saved. You're able to produce fruits of the Spirit. And so, let's look at that a little further. Look at verse 12. I might pronounce this wrong. His winnowing fan. Now, a winnowing fan is this. It's a wooden fork at this time used for tossing grain into the air. Not a little, not a little spork, okay, a little plastic spork. <laughs> We're talking about more like we would imagine a big wooden rake, all right, fanned out. And it was used for tossing grain into the air, and in this way the chaff would be separated and blown away. That's the type of winnowing uh, uh, fan that they're talking about. It is, and his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with, un with unquenchable fire. And so, what is... Well, let's, let's look at that. Let's look at that. Okay. That's a good question, though. First of all, what is chaff? <laughs> okay, no, that, that's, a, that's a perfect definition. Uh, and so if I went out to a wheat field uh, and I said, what is this, Lauren? You would simply tell me it was useful mater uh, use useless material, right? And break it down a little bit more in, in the context of wheat. Chaff would be the outer husk of the grain that has been removed before the grain can be ground into flour, right? And so in John's example in this verse, who is he likening to the wheat? The, the belief, those who believe, right? So who is John likening to the chaff? Those who refuse to believe. And so the deliverer will judge unbelievers. He will separate those who do not believe God's word and trust him from, uh, and trust him from those who believe. God's going to separate the two. And so what will the deliverer do with the unbelievers 
in the same way that the chaff was thrown into a fire and burned. He, yeah, he's going to cast them into the everlasting fire to be funny, uh, to be punished in the very end of times, right? Well, I want us to look here what we see in the, in the story is that Jesus came to John to be baptized. Now, this has caused a lot of folks confusion. And I'm not going to lie, when I was a new believer, I kind of struggled with this. Okay, I want to I want to be faithful. I want to follow Jesus. And you're telling me to be baptized. And so I want to follow Jesus and baptize. But then, well, why did Jesus baptize? Uh, was he saved and then he's following obedience? I mean, we've all thought through these things. And so look here in verses 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for this is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. So... In verse 17, we read, And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so what I want to see here first is that Jesus was approximately 30 years of age when he came to John to be baptized. Please don't ask the question how exactly I know that. I was looking that up uh, before I came. And uh, I'm sure there's a reason why they say that. I just don't know the, the scholar answer yet. But we do know that Jesus was not a sinner, right? <laughs> We've talked about this before. If Jesus was a sinner, what type of offering would it have been at Calvary? It would have been an insufficient one, right? Because it required a perfect sacrifice to fully satisfy the wrath of God. Okay? And so Jesus was not a sinner. And so that's not why he came to be baptized. And so what were all the people who came to be baptized by John showing? Yeah, they had agreed with God about their sin and a need for forgiveness, right? They were repenting. Okay, so why didn't Jesus need forgiveness? Lois? He was spotless. What what would you have to repent about? Remember, he was born without sin because he was not born through the seed of man. He was born to a virgin mother through the seed of the woman that God had promised all the way back in Genesis, right? And then we see that even as a 12-year-old, uh, that Jesus was without sin, that he was completely obedient to God the Father and all the commandments. He was completely righteous. And so when Jesus comes to John in the Jordan River to be baptized, it was not for repentance of his sin. So let's at least establish that much, okay? Because he was born sinless and he lived in complete harmony with God the Father, and Jesus did not need to deliver. <laughs> Why? Because Jesus was the deliverer. <laughs> Jesus came to be baptized to show that he had accepted John as God's prophet. That might be a light bulb moment for you. It, it, it has been for me. Jesus came to be baptized to show that he accepted John as God's prophet. The one that scripture had told about. The one that I, even Isaiah 700 years earlier had prophesied about. Jesus was putting basically his seal of approval, his mark of approval on the one that would come and, and, and lead people and point people to him. <laughs> you see? That's God. <laughs> we wouldn't come up with anything like that. That's absolutely amazing. God required baptism of those who accepted John's message of repentance. If Jesus had not been baptized, people would have thought that he was refusing to obey God's commands or that he did not believe John's message was from God. The Holy Spirit, and this is how we know that God was pleased with Jesus in doing this and acknowledging John's uh, uh, baptism. That the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit came to guide Jesus in his future work. And so the Spirit... Uh, came to, to guide Jesus in his, in his future work. When Jesus came up out of the water after John had baptized him, God the Spirit came to be with him to guide and to empower Jesus for the work God planned for him to do. Jesus was Almighty God, but when he became a man, he chose to depend on God the Spirit 
for the power to do God's will here on earth. Now, we discussed this the last couple of weeks. This has been brought up. Uh, and now remember, it was the, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, that would lead, is going to lead Jesus into the wilderness. Jesus would spend much time in prayer seeking the Father's will when he was in his earthly ministry. And so we have to understand this correctly. And so Jesus, while he was Almighty God, when he became a man, he chose to depend on God the Spirit for power to do God's will here on earth. God the Father was pleased with his Son. Look in verse 17. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am, I am well pleased. God the Father called Jesus my beloved Son. Now did Jesus have a beginning? He's eternal. Is Mary the mother of God or the mother of Jesus? Mother of Jesus, right? I want to make sure we have these things clear. We've talked about a lot of this, all right? Jesus is eternal. The Holy Spirit's eternal. God the Father is eternal. One God, three, three distinct persons, yet share the same nature, and they're eternal. They've, they don't have a beginning. They've always existed. Okay, so when Jesus took on the flesh of man in the incarnation, we, we learned about last week, uh, Jesus was what we would call, what theologians call the God-man, okay? He didn't give up anything. He added, he added humanity to him. And so he's all God. He didn't give up in his deity, and he's divineness, and then he's man. And so the God-man, uh, the promised deliverer, uh, is baptized, and God the Father says, uh, he's well pleased. This is my beloved son. And so although Jesus was a man, he was also God, the son who had come down from heaven. God was fully satisfied with Jesus. He was the only man who did everything that pleased God. And Jesus was without sin before his father. And so where the first Adam messed up and all Adam's descendants fall short of the glory of God. Jesus, who was born of a virgin uh, through the seed of the woman, uh, completely pleased God and God was well pleased with him. And he refers to him as his beloved son. So, John told the people that Jesus was the Lamb of God, right? Now think about this. Uh, turn to John chapter 1, verse 29. John 1, 29. Okay, so this is what, it's, this is what John records. He says, so the next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him. He didn't say, what's up, right? He said, behold, the Lamb of God. Not just any lamb. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All right, so what I want to see here is that from the time of Adam, or excuse me, from the time Adam sinned, God required believers to bring animal sacrifices in order to be accepted by him. So can you think of some instances where uh, an animal died as a substitute so a sinner could be accepted by God from some of the stories that we've talked about? Can you think of some of those? What about Abel? Remember Cain and Abel? Abel was accepted by God because he believed God and he offered a blood sacrifice. What did, what did Cain bring? Some granola bars, basically, right? Okay, a little bit more than that. but you, you get. What about Isaac? When Isaac was... <laughs> Nothing against granola bars, okay? I love them. Uh, Isaac was saved from death when God provided a what for him? A ram, right? A ram to die in his place. Not just any ram. A perfect, a spotless ram, right? The firstborn of every Israelite family was saved from death when God saw the lamb's blood on the door frames of their houses. The lamb had to die in place of the firstborn child. Remember the Exodus? And so... The blood of animals could not pay for sin, though. A temporary covering, but not a pleasing payment. Therefore, God sent Jesus into the world to completely pay the full price for sin and to deliver those who put their trust in him. And just as God provided the ram to die instead of Isaac, so God sent his son to be the lamb who would die in the place of sinners. Isn't that good news? That's the gospel. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel that Paul says, I'm not ashamed of. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's a power to bring salvation to everyone who believed, to the Jews first, but also to the Gentiles. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, 
as it is written, the just shall live by faith. It's good news indeed that, that God's going to provide and provided here the lamb, the perfect lamb. And so, hold on, we're almost done here. So John told his hearers that Jesus was the promised deliverer. Look in John 30, 34. 30 to 34. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, And I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. And I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you shall see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. John, or excuse me, God gave John a special sign so he would know the identity of the deliverer. Remember two weeks ago we asked, did John know for sure that Jesus Christ his, was the Christ, that, that, his, that his cousin was the promised deliverer? Did he know for sure? Well, God told John what to look for, how he would know for sure, and we see this. And so when, when John saw the sign from God, he knew for certain that Jesus was the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Can you imagine how relieved he was? Now we're going to read a little bit later on in another lesson. John's going to send his disciples to ask because he's starting to question things. Uh, But I want us to see this here at this conclusion. You know, we no longer need miraculous signs. This was a miraculous sign that God gave uh, John. So he would know for sure that Jesus was the promised deliverer, that he would see the spirit uh, uh, would appear and, and would rest on him. And he would know for sure that Jesus Christ was the deliverer that John had went out and prepared away in the wilderness for. But we no longer need these miraculous, these miraculous signs. Why? Well, we now have the Word of God. And the Lord wants us to trust what is written in it from the very first phrase. From the very first words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth all the way to the very end, all the way to the very last passage in the book of Revelation. If we refuse to believe his word, then God has nothing more to say to us. We will be condemned. Isn't it so important that we go out? It says, how will they believe if they don't hear? How will they hear if we don't go out and tell them? If we don't tell them what God's word says and they don't believe in the message from God's word, they're going to spend all eternity separated from their creator. Well, that's what, that's what the... The people that came down to the Jordan River to see this, this guy wearing strange clothing, eating strange food. This is what they come to hear from him. That you must approach God on his terms. And the way that you can approach him is through the one who I'm unworthy to even untie his sandals.